You're listening to my favorite talk show, The BG Show with Aditya. This is episode number 253 on the 28th of August 2020. As usual, this episode is divided into three sections. The first section is talking about the record making prowess by James Anderson who took 600 wickets and how a group of Pass bowlers can overcome him despite the pseudo experts claim to the contrary. The second part will be the reading of the poetry rhyme of the ancient mariner. It will be part one of a six part reading. The third part will be as usual some light reading from the book of P.G. Woodhouse on Omnibus. So, James Anderson, England's fast bowler, became the first fast bowler to take 600 wickets. But my listeners must be thinking, what's so special about that? It's not the first time a bowler has taken wickets or reached a record number of wickets. Well, if this was 1970s, 1980s or the early 1990s, it would have been called something great. It could have been seen as normal, but in the realm of what they call a pseudo modern day cricket or a pseudo T20 affected era over the past 15 years, it's a great achievement for a bowler to choose test matches over the 20 over fast food version. It's a great deal because there is a slight difference because Anderson is a fast bowler. What do we mean by a fast bowler? Somebody whose speed is between 135 and 145 kilometers per hour means he has a long run up. He has to bowl at least 20-25 overs in a day and if you take 6 minutes per over means you have spent around 150 minutes just bowling and then Standing like zombies in the field, in the outfield, also makes a difference on one's fitness. And as you know, age is a very tricky conversation in sports. He is 38. So the question is, how long will this baller continue? And before you know, claims have already been put that no other fast baller can break his record. But I disagree with that group. For me, there is a set of seven talented younger fast bowlers whose record is much better than Anderson because Anderson's record is limited to a certain geographical region. Means out of 156 matches he has played, 89 have been at home where he has picked up 384 wickets. Which means for my lay listeners that he has been able to exploit the so-called bowling conditions, the overcast skies, the swing, the reverse swing and other things which are not possible outside the UK means they are not possible in Australia or South Africa or even India or any of the other subcontinent nations. While there may be a logic for some pseudo experts to put to raise that no other fast bowler may be able to break this record simply because of the pressures of bowlers today playing all three formats. I still disagree with this pseudo experts group. For me, as I said, there is a set of seven talented fast bowlers who will break his record. At least they will get somewhere near. They may even go past him. And this is despite the influence of the coronavirus circus and all the unnecessary fear that is surrounding around this coronavirus 
circus so who are the seven special fast bowlers who can do the job well in my view they are three fast bowlers from india three fast bowlers from australia and one from south africa so who are these seven bowlers it's bumra shami and ishan from india it's stark comins and hazelwood from australia and of course it's rabada from south africa why i haven't selected other countries because other countries have a limited schedule in which they play their matches yes from new zealand a trend bold and a team saudi certainly can do the job but they are injury prone more than any other group of fast bowlers i have ever seen right now we see this james anderson as a great fast bowler a legend and what not but if 10 to 12 years ago when he was just easing himself into the sport had you said that this fast bowler would take 600 wickets even the most fanatic of fans for this guy would have said that's an impossibility because just as he was easing himself into this sport the influence of the 20 over fast food version was also beginning to take place despite claims to the contrary that sports matches or the number of matches between two countries may be less because of this pandemic circus i still feel the job can be done by these six fast bowlers that's like saying that a certain ravichandran ashwin and a nathan lyon will break mulli dharan's record of 800 wickets why not if you look at mulli dharan's record who retired himself 10 years ago with 800 wickets 90% of his wickets came in condition which are made for this particular style of bowling that is in the subcontinent that includes a neighboring countries sri lanka bangladesh pakistan and other countries where the wickets as they say are dry where the ball spins like anything and then everyone is influenced by the status given to a certain bowler so apart from anderson's 600 record breaking spree can an indian fast bowler for now break kapil dev's 434 record yes it can be broken if india play the right number of matches and india persists with that group of fast bowlers the record can be broken without any question let's look at some of the fanatic terms for him in his hour of glory several facets of his career stand out the unflinching devotion to his craft the maniacal conditioning of his body and how well he takes care of those wrists the keenness to keep learning and evolving the sacrifice of staying aloof of limited overs cricket and the unquenched thirst to keep playing a perfect modern day specimen of athlete bowler yet the master of an old fashion art these are the words or these are the adjectives we are using to describe him then i can put these words for the other seven fast bowlers as well though i will refrain from using the words old fashion and modern day and staying away from a format to concentrate on another format and the influence of a certain format on another format because terms like modern day and old fashion are superficial they don't influence anyone they did not do that in 1990 they won't do that in 2020 or 2090 according to these experts anderson's landmark would need a monumental effort to surpass for posterity according to me it's irrelevant whether the current crop of fast bowlers or the younger versions if they are going in that direction who let's say play all formats of the game and are injury prone and there are a lot of other things happening according to a few experts it's not going to be surpassed because of the reason i discussed earlier 
well according to me those reasons are just an excuse to dote on one individual to be fanatic about one individual and if we say that nobody else can surpass it then we are insulting the talent of the seven fast bowlers i have named and that is not going to happen definitely not under my watch so those who are obsessed about statistics and follow all these achievements well i am not one of them but those who do take out the cutting from the newspaper you must have put when a certain earthly ambrose reached 500 wickets at that time the same words must have been used people must have said it's impossible to break this record and see what happens two decades later remember that was 2001 and that was not the era of of the influence of the fast food version and still i'm sure these words must have been used and at that time the likes of broad anderson bumra shami ishan had not even made their debuts they were still kids let's for a moment gloss over this pandemic circus and the three formats the white ball the limited overs format let's get over it for a moment let's gloss over it and say that can this record be broken in a logical manner yes because whenever a record is created we say that it cannot be broken it has happened so many times nobody thought that ian botham's record of 383 wickets would be broken it was broken twice nobody thought that richard hadley's record of 200 wickets would be broken it was broken nobody thought that a spinner would reach 600 wickets forget 500 wickets yet three spinners have 600 wickets whom we adore and whom we are fanatic about and we think that the current spinners are not good enough well that's not the case for me the two spinners the two top spinners that is ashwin and lion can they break records yes do they have time on their hands yes if the likes of won murli dharan kumle can play till the age of 39 that ashwin and nathan lyon have time on their side at least five more years they have the talent and let me tell you ashwin and lyon are more talented than won mulidran and kumble put together some of the fanatics may scoff at this their eyeballs will come out from the sockets but i will not refrain from saying this despite all the fictional road blocks created in pseudo articles written by pseudo experts can the record be broken yes will it be broken definitely when will it be broken in time to come do we have the group of bowlers who can do the job i have already named part 2 of this episode is part 1 of the poetry reading the poem is the rhyme of the ancient mariner by samuel taylor coleridge written in 1834 it is an ancient mariner and he stopped one of three by the long gray beard and glittering eye Now wherefore stoppest thou me? The bridegroom's doors are opened wide, and I am next of kin. The guests are met, the feast is set. Mayest hear the merry din. He holds them with his skinny hand. There was a ship, quoted he. Hold off, unhand me, grey beard loon. If stones his hands dropped, he. He holds them with his glittering eye. The wedding guest stood still and listens like a three years child. The mariner had his will. The wedding guest sat on a stone, cannot choose but hear, and thus spake on that ancient man, the bright-eyed mariner. The ship was 
cheered, the harbour cleared. Merrily did we drop below the kirk, below the hill, below the lighthouse top. The sun came upon the left, out of the sea came he, and he shone bright and on the right went down into the sea. Higher and higher every day till the mast at noon. The wedding guest here beat his breast, for he heard the loud bassoon. The bride had paced into the hall, red as rose is she. Nodding their heads before her goes the merry minstrel see. The wedding guest he beat his breast, yet he cannot choose but hear. And thus spake on that ancient man, the bright-eyed mariner. And now the storm blast came, and he was tyrannous and strong. He struck with his overtaking wings, and chased us south along. With sloping mast and dipping prow, as you pursued the yell and blow, still treads the shadow of his foe, and forward bends his head. The ship drove fast, loud roared the blast, and southward I we fled. Now there came both mist and snow, and it grew wondrous cold. Ice, mast high, came floating by, as green as emerald, and through the drifts the snowy cliffs did send a dismal sheen. Nor shapes of men nor beasts we ken, the ice was all between. The ice was here, the ice was there, the ice was all around. It cracked and growled and roared and howled, like noises in a swamp. At length did cross an, an albatross, through the fog it came, as if it had been a Christmas soul, we hailed it in God's name. It ate the food it never had eat, and round and round it flew. The ice did split with a thunder pit. Man steered us through, and good south wind sprung up behind. The albatross did follow, and every day for food or play came to the mariner's hollow. In mist or cloud, on mast or shroud, it perched for vespers nine. Whilst all the night through fog smoke white glimmered the white moon shine. God save the ancient mariner from the fiends that plague thee thus. Why lookest thou with my cross bow? I shot the albatross. The sun now rose upon the right. Out of the sea came he, still hidden mist and on the left went down into the sea, and the good south wind still flew behind, but no sweet bird did follow, nor any day for food or play came to the mariner's hollow. And I had done a hellish thing, and it would work them woe, for all a word I had killed the bird that made the breeze to blow. Our wretch, said they, the bird to slay, that made the breeze to blow. Nor dim nor red, like God's own head, the glorious sun oppressed. Then all a word I had killed the bird that brought the fog and mist. It was right, said they, such birds to slay, that bring the fog and mist. The fair breeze blew, the white form flew, the furrow followed free. We were the first that ever burst into that silent sea. Down dropped the breeze, the sails dropped down. It was sad as sad could be, and we did speak only to break the silence of the sea. All in a hot and copper sky, the bloody sun at noon, right above the mast, did stand no bigger than the moon. Day after day, day after day, we stuck, nor breath, nor motion, as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. Water, water, everywhere, and all the boards did shrink. Water, water, everywhere, nor any drop to drink. The very deep did rot, O Christ that ever this should be. 
Yet slimy things did crawl with legs upon the slimy sea, about about in wheel and rout. The death fires dance at night. The water like a witch's oils burn green and blue and white. And some in dreams a short word of the spirit that plagued us so. Nine fathom deep he had followed us from the land of mist and snow. And every tongue through utter drought was withered at the root. We could not speak no more than if we had been choked with soot. How well a day would evil looks and I from old and young. Inset of the cross, the albatross about my neck was hung. This ends part one of the poetry reading, that is the reading of the poem, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. More will follow, so stay tuned for the next episode. time for some humor so let's read from aunt omnibus from pg woodhouse she had what jeeves had called a talking point very well tell me all but briefly it won't take long and then you can be off to beddy by you remember that little black statuette thing on the table at dinner Ah yes, the eyesore. Uncle Watkin bought it from a man called Plank, so I gathered. Well, do you know what he paid him for it? A thousand quid, didn't you say? No, I didn't. I said it was worth that. But he got it out of this poor blighter Plank for a fiver. You are kidding. No, I am not. He paid him five pounds. He makes no secret of it. When we were at Brinkley, he was showing the thing to Mr. Travers and telling him all about it. How he happened to see it on Plank's mantelpiece and spotted how valuable it was and told Plank it was worth practically nothing. But he would give him five pounds for it because he knew how hard up he was gloated over how clever he had been and Mr. Travers writhed like an egg whisk. I could well believe it if there's one thing that makes a collector spit blood it's hearing about another collector getting a bargain. How do you know Plank was hard up? Well, he would have let the thing go for a fiver if he wasn't. Something in that. You can't say Uncle Watkin isn't a dirty dog. I would never dream of saying he isn't. And he always has been the dirtiest of dogs. It bears out what I have frequently maintained. That there are no depths to which magistrates won't stoop. I don't wonder you ask hands. Your Uncle Watkin stands revealed as a chiseler of the lowest type, but nothing to be done about it, of course. I don't know so much about that. Why have you tried doing anything? In the sort of way, I arranged that Harold should preach a very strong sermon on Nabbard's vineyard. Not that I suppose you have ever heard of Nabbard's vineyard. I bridled. She had offended my armor proper. I doubt if there's a man in London and the home counties who had the facts relating to Nabbot's vineyard more thoroughly at his fingertips than me. The news may have not reached you, but when at school I once won a prize for scripture knowledge. I bet you cheated. This ends episode number 253 on the 28th of August 2020. If you enjoyed this 
particular episodes send your feedback for more awesome content tune in to the next episode of the weekly show with aditya